In 2013, APWU, NELC, and a group of non-governmental organizations concerned with the lack of access to affordable banking services created the Coalition for Postal Banking. The Coalition is working to convince the Congress and the public that reviving the postal banking system that operated in the old post office department between 1911 and 1967 is an idea whose time has come for the second time. Millions of Americans are unbanked or they're underbanked, and the Postal Service's retail network is perfectly situated to solve the problem. But financial exclusion is just the tip of the iceberg when it comes to the problems that it causes, as our next guest speaker knows all too well. She is Mirsa Bharataran, an associate professor of law at the University of Georgia Law School in Athens, Georgia, where she teaches contracts and banking law. Last year, she authored a path-breaking book entitled How the Other Half Banks, published by the Harvard University Press. It explores the history of bank regulation in America, the heavy costs imposed on Americans that are unserved by the private banking industry, and how the Postal Service could provide a solution to serious problems facing millions of Americans unserved by private banks. How the Other Half Banks, which has received significant media coverage and has been featured in the New York Times, The Atlantic, Slate, American Banker, is helping drive the movement for postal banking, which, as you heard, is now embraced by the Democratic Party's platform. Brothers and sisters, it's my pleasure to welcome Professor Mercer Bharataran to the NELC convention. Professor, the podium is yours. Perfect, thank you. I'm, I'm, a, uh, I'm Olympic gymnast height, and so I needed a block underneath me. So. <laughs> Although without the skill, unfortunately. It's very expensive to be poor. Imagine that you work at a low wage job, and it's a struggle each month to make it from one paycheck to another. You don't have a bank account because most banks have abandoned your low income neighborhood and because you don't trust them anymore, because they charge punishingly high fees for minor mistakes. Without a bank account, it's hard for you to save your money. Not only that, but you have to pay a fee to turn each of your paychecks into cash. You are one of the 40 million unbanked Americans who spend 10% of your income each year just to be able to use it. To put this in perspective, this is the same per percentage that the unbanked use to pay for food. Now imagine a different scenario. Like nearly half of the US population, you have less than $500 in savings. That's right, half of the US population has less than $500 in savings. With such little savings, you feel like you're always just treading water. This month, you stumble. Your car breaks down, and you need $400, $500 to repair it. There's no way you're going to make it this month. You don't want to get evicted, and you'll do whatever it takes to feed your kids. So you're forced to get a small loan until you can recover from this financial setback. Where can you go? The reality is that even if you have a bank account, the underbanked have to get loans from financial um, fringe lenders, payday lenders, title lenders, and other high interest lenders. Banks don't give small loans anymore. So the modern day loan sharks charge 
300 to 2,000 percent interest. So even if you needed $500 this month for rent, car repairs, or food, by the time your loan is paid off, you've paid over $2,000, and you're stuck in a cycle of debt as you borrow from one lender to pay off another. Not only does this crushing interest make it difficult for you to ever pay off this loan, it will end up ruining your credit and may even lead to your bankruptcy. Not to mention the financial uh, or the psychological stress that that kind of debt brings on people. So you were looking for a lifesaver to get you through the month, but what you got was an anchor that submerged you into further debt. Whose fault is this? I sometimes hear people say that those who take out payday loans need financial education so that they can choose not to take out these loans. But this assumes that people take out these loans because they have other options and they're doing it frivolously. They do not. It is not that the low income are choosing to borrow at high costs because they don't understand that the loans are costly. They actually do understand. They understand very well, that there's, but there's nowhere else for them to turn. Banks are not interested in small deposits and small loans. What I see as a banking scholar is a disparity in banking services today. We have a mainstream, regulated, federally subsidized banking sector serving the wealthy and the middle class, and a wild west hodgepodge of unregulated, unregulated lenders that provide services to the low income at a very high cost. How did we get here? Over the past 30 years, there was a merger wave that swept through the banking industry that completely transformed the way we bank in this country. While this country used to be dominated by community banks, today there's about five banks that control everything. So basically, in a decade or two, I don't know if you've seen It's a Wonderful Life, but in a decade or two, George Bailey's bank got sucked into Potter's bank, and then that bank got sucked into Bank of America. And once the community banks left, they created what we call banking deserts. And once you have a banking desert, who comes in to fill the void? It's the payday lenders and the check cashers. As community banks are dying, our society is still stuck in this myth that community banks are the only answer to our banking problem. Every law enacted over the past 30 years to deal with this has been trying to entice community banks into these communities, but they're not interested. And so I think in order to face this large problem that we have, we need a large solution. Many people in the financial industry are, I've spoken to Treasury, to Senate, to the White House, and they all say, well, maybe some new technology will fix this. Um, some, they call it fintech, right? Financial technology. And certainly technology is going to make everything easier and cheaper, but it is not a replacement for traditional banking, saving and borrowing money. Because saving and borrowing money requires trust. Trust is the currency of banking. Banks operate using other people's money, and for this to work, the bank needs to be trusted. Since the beginning of banking, in the 1600s in Scotland, until today, the only institution strong enough to provide trust to banks has been the federal government. We can innovate around the details, but the essential government-bank relationship hasn't changed in hundreds of years. In other words, when it comes to saving and borrowing, many people would rather do it at a dusty old institution that they know is going to be around for 20 years as opposed to a nimble startup financial technology company. This is why I think instead of looking for, to the future for an answer, we must study the past to see what has worked. As it just so happens, there is a large national government-backed institution that exists in every poor community. Guess what it is? The U.S. Post Office. In, in fact, in fact, as I show in the book, and it's a much forgotten history, this institution did function as a bank for much of our history. The U.S. Constitution not only predates, I'm sorry, the U.S. Post Office not only predates our Constitution, it is not an overstatement to say that the Post Office built the foundation of our democracy. And it's not just me that says this, it was de Tocqueville. 
In his famous treatise on democracy, he says that the post office changed America. This is because the, the, post, the Postal Act of 1792, signed by George Washington, Alexander Hamilton, James Madison, all of our founders, said that the post would be financially supported by the Treasury. It would be self-sustaining but not profitable. It would serve every community without regards to profits, and that Congress would subsidize the dissemination of newspapers, information across the country without worrying about costs. So this made this, this institution foundational to our democracy. Right after the Civil War in 1871 was the first time a postmaster general said, we should do postal banking. Great Britain had started in 1861. But as is often the case with banking reform, it took a crisis to get anything done. And the crisis that we needed to start postal banking was the panic of 1907. Teddy Roosevelt immediately said, we need postal banking to calm our markets and to uh, ruin the, uh, to, to get rid of the panics in our financial system. In 1910, we finally got the postal banking bill with the help of President Taft and it established a new saving system in our country, the United States Postal Saving System. By 1913, the Times declared it to be already self-sustaining and a success, having received $32 million in deposits in just two years. Starting in, the, in 1930, during the Great Depression, as people, as banks were failing all across the country, all of those deposits went to the safest place. Guess where? The post office. And those deposits doubled every year of the Great Depression. And they would have kept doubling if FDR hadn't chose, chosen FDIC insurance. But what happens is then we start in the world wars. And what FDR does is say, we're going to use these deposit accounts of the post office to fund the wars. So for both World War I and World War II, the postal savings um, system uh, brought in $8 billion to fund those two wars through selling those defense saving stamps. So Americans saved a lot of money back then. It was easy to do because they felt like it was their patriotic duty. Schools um, sold defense saving stamps so kids could get their, um, their postal banking account and help fund the war. Deposits reached their peak in 1947 with 3.4 billion depositors. Many of them were soldiers abroad who could mail their, um, uh, their paychecks back home to be used here. By the 1950s, the postal banking um, sector had a decline. Why? Because in the 1950s, this is the golden era of community banking. Every community has a bank and they have the post office. And the post office was restricted in the deposits they could charge and, or to pay. And so the deposits in the postal banks declined. Note that this would not be the case decades later as those banks started to abandon those areas. So 1966, President Johnson abolished the postal banking system over the union's dissent. Postal banking died a quiet death in America without much public discussion and has since been forgotten. But it's important to remember that postal banking was America's most successful experiment in financial inclusion, and it remains so abroad. It helped create a culture of saving and provided a, a, a safe place for people to go when banks were failing across the country. So this historical view is important, I think, because today's problems of unequal banking look a lot more like 1910, unfortunately, than like 1966 when the postal banks ended. So what if the new big solution to our problems is actually an old one? If we return to a system of postal banking, we would eliminate banking deserts in this country, leaving no American unbanked. This is an institution that people trust. The post office has never been a shark. This stability is crucial to promote savings. In addition, the post office never left low-income neighborhoods and still has branches in communities long deserted by banks. In addition, um, most unbanked people still use cash. They need a physical location to put their money. This is not to say that they would have to remain in cash. Once you have a bank account, you can have debit cards, credit cards, and you can join the digital economy, which will lower the cost you have to pay for financial transactions. So imagine again that you have $500, that you need $500 this month 
except now you can go to the post office, an institution not trying to benefit from your desperation, like the payday lenders do. Instead of paying 2,000% interest, you pay 10% interest, so you can get out of the hole that you're in. I suspect that if anyone can offer a safe loan, it is this public institution that is enmeshed in our democracy. In addition to its long-held mission of public service, the post office has just lower costs abroad. We already have existing branches that will give us a lower advantage, a lower um, cost that would advantage us in giving uh, cheaper loans. Today in America, the poor pay the most for credit and financial services. Indeed, the less money you have, the more money you have to pay just to use it. And while offering the poor a place to save their money and get a reasonably priced loan will not cure poverty. This is not about that. It will help provide a lifeline instead of a crushing burden for those in their time of need. And there's no better institution to, that, to do this than a trusted government institution that helped build our democracy. And it still manages to deliver mail to every country in the U.S. regardless of cost, thanks to you has branches in every neighborhood, and has the public as its central mission. The post office may be struggling to survive, but so are millions of Americans. Postal banking could breathe life into both, and this is what you call a win-win. Thank you. Thank you, Mercer. We appreciate you coming. I want to let everybody know that the book is uh, available on NELC uh, online. It's available, okay? I think it's up on the screen. How about a letter carrier cheer for Mercer for coming out and talking to us? Hip, hip. Hooray! Hip, hip. Hooray! Hip, hip.